Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Dr. Mahboob Yaqub. I'm a consultant liaison psychiatrist in Shifa International Hospital, Islamabad. Uh, morning for those who are uh, living in the part of the world where it's, it is morning, but uh, can be evening, afternoon if you are from a different time zone. Right, it, it, it seems a bit weird, uh, quite a weird experience. If, if, if in any other circumstances, I, I was telling people that about a couple of hundred people were uh, listening, to, listening to me, watching me, that will be considered as a delusion. But um, I can be reassured that it's not a delusion that so many people are watching me and listening to me and I cannot directly interact with them. Uh, and and, and, and uh, that's, that's also further reassurance that I've got a few people sitting in front of me as well, although maintaining the social distancing. Uh, we are times, difficult times with this pandemic environment and we are all trying to learn. We are all trying to uh, uh, cope with, with, with these circumstances and considering the human beings resilience and um, our adaptability um, uh, over the years, over the centuries in, in fact, I'm sure we will move forward and will come out of it much stronger. Starting. Um, there are three major sources that this, this webinar is based on. However, I, I did incorporate bits of uh, information from other sources, minor information, but, but the chunk of this webinar is, is based on these three sources. One is, uh, again, based in um, America. It was last updated in, in December 2019. Uh, very thorough, very thorough uh, resource if you want to refer to that. And the second one was a review published in 2011. Um, again, bits of uh, the, the presentation of delirium and the treatment strategy, especially the pathophysiology was based on this, this resource. And then I have specifically referred to the Royal College of Psychiatrists guidelines as well on uh, the management of COVID delirium, uh, which was, I believe, published just a couple of months ago or about three months ago. Uh, so it's it's a mix. It's uh, I, I would try to be uh, thorough but still brief. Uh, we I, I, there are time constraints as well, and we need to allow some time for the question answer. In terms of uh, the topic itself, yeah, delirium, acute confusional state. Um, let me confess that delirium in general is no different from COVID delirium. There will be slight differences uh, in in the management of COVID delirium. And I believe many of you may have uh, registered for this webinar reading the word COVID. So probably you took the bait. But in, in, in general, the, the uh, treatment principles are gonna be the same, slight differences in how we treat the COVID delirium. The overview is gonna be first part, uh, I will be touching on delirium in general. It's presentation, it's pathophysiology, uh, followed by the challenges to the management of COVID delirium and then the psychotropic medications in general uh, for the delirium as well as COVID delirium. And I'll try to give you enough time to ask questions and I will try to um, respond to as many as possible. So we'll, we'll make a start. So delirium or acute confusion state, generally uh, it, it, it cannot be seen as a psychiatric illness itself, but it's a, it's a clinical syndrome uh, more commonly it presents in elderly. Many of us have, have read that. Many of us has, has gone through that information. Characterized by alteration of consciousness uh, and cognition with reduced ability to focus, sustain, and shift attention. So there, is, there, there are difficulties with consciousness, cognition, as well as attention problems. Uh, it develops over a short course of time. Uh, around hours to days is, is very typical for delirium. And that's where the history is so very important uh, when the patient presents to the hospitals with, with such an emergency. And the other uh, significant bit is that the, the presentation fluctuates during the course of the day. If, if, if the patient was presenting with agitation and uh, some psychotic-like symptoms, this bit of fluctuations during the course of the day is, is very typical of delirium and it does not happen in, in other psychotic illnesses. 
So that's again, history suggests that and the uh, thorough examination and the observation of the patient within, within the wards. And then the psychomotor behavioral disturbances such as hyperactivity, hypoactivity, or there may be a combination of both. The, the data suggests that around 25% of the uh, um, overall delirium presentations are actually hyperactive delirium. Uh, around 50% are hypoactive delirium and the remaining 25 are a bit of a mix of uh, these two presentations. And it's the hypoactivity which, which gets missed, where the diagnosis of delirium gets missed. And it's the hyperactivity which actually in a way over represents and uh, most of us think that the, the delirium almost always present with hyperactivity. So we've got to be cautious about that, that we should not miss even the hypoactive delirium. And then there is the disruption in the sleep-wake cycle, uh, again, a quite a typical feature of delirium. And if it's happening, starting acutely uh, and, and, and presenting with all, all, all these uh, problems with attention, we, we, should not be, we should not be missing that at all. Very crucial. Generally, uh, caused by medical condition, almost always we find uh, an underlying organic cause, but not necessarily. There can be substance intoxication issues, there can be withdrawal of uh, some medications, or some medications themselves can cause uh, the, the delirium in, in some cases. So again, the history will be very crucial while assessing these patients. And it, it, is, it is not really explained by any of the pre-existing neurocognitive disorders like, like dementia. So it should not just be a further deterioration in a patient's already known dementia. There has to be a very clear change in the pattern the patient is presenting. Uh, the, his, the, 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 the literature suggests that uh, diagnosis is very often missed. Uh, and especially, as I mentioned in the previous slide, that hypoactive type is, is, is getting missed uh, because of the poor cl clinical manifestations. And uh, since it's a life-threatening emergency, we need to treat it as, as essentially as a medical emergency, not necessarily a psychiatric disorder. And the patient needs to be treated in hospital, ideally in a medical ward. Uh, unless they are already admitted in, let's say, a surgical ward or in any other specialty. So wherever possible, we need to um, try and prevent the development of delirium or diagnose it early so that it, it further complications uh, can be prevented. Now, coming to the causes, uh, the, the current internationally accepted theories are multifactorial. Um, not, not one single factor can cause uh, and even can precipitate the delirium, but most of the cases we will find a plethora of uh, causes. And the causes can be divided into predisposing and precipitating factors. The most common pre predisposing factors are age, of course, more uh, over the age of 70, they are quite prone to developing delirium then uh, pre-existing dementia, functional disabilities, uh, sensory deprivations, mild cognitive impairment, which, uh, well, uh, an early phase of dementia, and in some cases we can, we can call it, and alcohol can also be a contributing factor, depending on which part of the, the world people are living and what kind of culture they are from, and what uh, general uh, habits they, they have had uh, in their early life or the preceding time to the development of delirium. Lab abnormalities uh, are, are quite common again uh, when, 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 when we are addressing the combination of the causes. Uh, quite often we do find laboratory um, or blood investigation abnormalities and we can touch on that. Se several to name. There can be electrolyte imbalances, there can be um, uh, anemia, which can be uh, uh, leading to the development of uh, delirium, liver function problems, kidney function problems. So it's, it's, a, it's a very, very complex topic indeed. Uh, precipitating factors, drugs are set to be uh, very important in many studies. Sedative hypnotics, anticholinergic drugs, um, our favorite, uh, procyclidine uh, is used quite commonly. And please be aware, it can contribute to the development of delirium. Opioid analgesics uh, have been reported in some studies, same uh, as antihistamines, anticonvulsants, tricyclic antidepressants. 
and H2 blockers, in some cases, anti-Parkinsonian agents as well. Uh, and believe me or not, antipsychotics can also, in some cases, especially the low potency ones, uh, can, can uh, precipitate delirium. Among other precipitating factors, surgery, surgical interventions, hospital admissions themselves, anemia infections, acute illnesses, or an exacerbation of chronic illnesses, let's say, if it's a, an exacerbation of COPD, certainly can lead to delirium. So it's, it's, it's literally, you can see, it's, 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 a, it's a huge list of uh, predisposing and precipitating factors. The nature is usually transient. It goes on for a few days and it does settle if, we, if you manage it appropriately. Uh, there have been some, some studies published about the further complications. Uh, the systemic review uh, published has shown that hospital delirium persisted uh, even after discharge. Uh, and as I said earlier, hypoactive delirium can be uh, um, a contributory factor why it, it got missed or it did not get completely resolved. And in about 33% of the cases in that study, it, it persisted about one month later. Uh, overall, the etiology is not fully understood. The underlying mechanisms are, are not really uh, fully understood. S research is still going on. And... Uh, Many cases, if, if it has been um, precipitated by medication, we, we simply have to uh, incorporate these simple measures that identify if there was a medication started and simply stop it. Prevalence is higher in elderly population, already uh, touched on the previous slides, uh, but surgical complications, uh, it, it does present as surgical complication in, 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 in many cases, around 15 to 25% after major elective surgery, up to 50% in, in major uh, high-risk procedures like hip fracture or cardiac surgery. Around one third of the medical patients, medical inpatients, especially if they are 17 years of old, uh, age or older, they develop uh, delirium and half of them develop it prior to the admission and the remaining half develop during the admission. Uh, around 20 to 24% uh, they do, they present through emergency and misdiagnosis can cause mortality in about 10 to 36% uh, of the patients. There is uh, around a 70% increased risk of death uh, during the first six months and, and that's crucial. That's very, very crucial. Uh, we got to follow, follow these patients up and it, this, these figures about 70% uh, increased risk of death, it is related to the severity of delirium and the age of the patient as well. Delirium developed in intensive care units as well, quite sig significantly higher number of patients who uh, have had treatment within the ICU environment, they develop delirium. And the same goes with the general medical or geriatric wards as well. Pathophysiology. Um, we have uh, touched on that earlier that uh, the overall underlying mechanisms are not very um, uh, well understood at the moment. There are several theories. Uh, some theories are about neuroinflammation, neurotransmitter imbalance, chronic stress, or, or even a combination of all of them because underlying mechanism in the end seems to be uh, pointing towards neuroinflammation and neurotransmitter at the same time. So neuroinflammation hypothesis suggests that um, whenever there is uh, an inflammation, whenever there is an infection in the body and there is uh, an inflammatory response, systemic uh, inflammatory response, cytokines are produced. Uh, they can have various, various impact on uh, the body but these cytokines can damage the blood-brain barrier, crossing the blood-brain barrier and further uh, triggering the neuroinflammatory response uh, within the brain as well. And that further impairs the um, uh, synapse, synaptic function of the, the brain cells. The uh, significant uh, substrate for these neuroinflammatory uh, processes is hippocampus, which is related to the cognition, the, the learning, uh, the attention uh, functions of the brain. So if that is uh, damaged, the cognitive disability due to synaptic plasticity and an impairment uh, is triggered. 
then the GABA receptors have been uh, uh, also shown to be affected by neuroinflammation and GABA or favorite GABA, the benzodiazepines uh, substrate are these GABA receptors. And generally GABA receptors are uh, inhibitory receptors. And when, once they, the inhibitory action is gone, obviously we, we, we are going to have some uncontrolled and uh, um, not really uh, something that we can predict. Uh, any, any, any kind of uh, presentation, any kind of uh, hyperactivity syndrome can be presented. Then the cholinergic deficiency hypothesis. Acetylene is, 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 is a neurotransmitter which is uh, important for the uh, smooth function of the hippocampal regions. And this, this theory suggests that uh, the, these neuroinflammatory responses or even the medications, the drugs sometimes, can disrupt the acetylene, acetylcholine function and that can lead to the delirium or at least can precipitate delirium. Then the neurotransmitter imbalance theory, uh, dopamine seems to play uh, an important part, but this, this ties up with the acetylcholine as well. Uh, increased dopamine function uh, seems to have been triggered by uh, the neuroinflammatory responses, and that in turn uh, downgrades the cholinergic pathway. So that's, that's the overlapping balance we have in the brain. So dopaminergic and cholinergic uh, pathways, they, they, they overlap in the brain. And uh, some, some, something similar happens in the psychotic phenomena as well, where the dopamine activities increase. And that's where we use the uh, dopamine antagonists, which, which, which does help and seems to be helpful in the delirium as well. Uh, dopamine access, we have already touched on that, and amino acid hypothesis, serotonin seems to be uh, um, a neurotransmitter which, which uh, contributes to this, this uh, hypothesis or the theory in, 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 in fact. The tryptophan, uh, amino acid tryptophan seems to be the, um, the, the, the major precursor for production of serotonin, and if for some reason, the tryptophan cannot uh, enter the brain for the production of serotonin. The lack of serotonin seems to be contributing to the uh, uh, development or precipitation of the delirium. Uh, one study suggested that tryptophan competes with the amino acid phenylalanine, and this transport happens through the blood-brain barrier and such, such disruption in amino acid uh, transportation uh, is, is, is appearing to be contributing to the development of delirium. And then the chronic stress hypothesis. Cortisol is the main hormone in response to stress and deleterious effect on the 5-HT1A. So these are serotonin receptors. Similarly, uh, high cortisol level seems to uh, cause the GABA reduction function. And as we have already touched on the importance of the hippocampal region, it, it does have a, a, a negative impact on the hippocampal function and the learning and the memory function. Uh, excess glucocorticoid causes cell death by various mechanisms, including hypoxia, ischemia, seizures, hypoglycemia, and energy failure. Uh, it, there are some studies uh, reporting that hypothetically Patients with delirium have a disturbance in the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, again related to the, uh, or, or supporting the chronic, chronic stress hypothesis. But I would once again like to stress here that it's, it's not just any one of these mechanisms. They may be overlapping, they may all be happening at the same time. Now, this theory is related to the current pandemic uh, uh, difficulties, the COVID, where patients do have uh, decreased oxygen saturations, breathing difficulties, uh, the oxidative impairment theory. Decrease generally in the uh, oxygenation or um, oxygen supply to the uh, brain can cause cerebral dysfunction and that uh, can lead to some neuroinflammatory responses, cell deaths in some cases, and the cascade of uh, that whole neuroinflammation and the neurotransmitter uh, imbalance, uh, all contributing to this, this uh, delirious state. 
Right, move on to the assessment. Um, again, from very early stages in our careers, we have had these trainings, how to assess. The general assessment for any patient is, is not gonna be any different from uh, the delirium patients. It needs to be thorough. Uh, detailed history from a collateral source of information about when it started, uh, any predisposing factors uh, uh, will be easily identifiable in the history, but uh, the, the, the onset of uh, development of or development of delirium within, an hour, within a few hours to days is, is very crucial in the history. Physical examination from head to toe, uh, detailed neurological examination, whether there is some uh, cerebral vascular insult uh, uh, suggested, any transient ischemic attacks. Uh, so detailed history, very, very detailed history and detailed examination is, is crucial in identification of the delirium because many a times it can be a diagnosis of exclusion. Then uh, in, in terms of blood investigations, uh, uh, routine ones that we, we often do for these patients, but some uh, others to be included are uh, vitamin B12, folate levels, vitamin D. Uh, they often, their deficiencies often uh, mimic the psychiatric illnesses than the bone profile and the C-reactive protein as the inflammatory marker. Chest radiography uh, and ECG should be routine investigations. And if we think there may be a neurological cause, the lumbar function uh, lumbar puncture is is advised. Uh, cultures can be sent depending on the suspicion if there is sepsis. Specific assessment tools. The, the Royal College of Psychiatrists advocates the use of confusion assessment methods. It's a short method and essentially the four uh, features that I, I uh, went through at the very beginning of these, this webinar uh, those four features are assessed within this confusion assessment method and uh, very effective. High sensitivity around 94% uh, to 100% and specificity is also between 90% to 95%. So we should incorporate either this uh, um, assessment tool or uh, we should incorporate in our overall assessment. Some other tools which have been reported to be effective in delirium um, assessment are delirium observation screening scale, delirium rating scale, memorial delirium uh, assessment scale, nursing delirium screening scale, and the nursing delirium screening scale is important because many a times nurses are at the front line to, to come across these patients who may have been developing delirium or have already developed it and um, very, very significant bits of information will come from the nursing staff as well. The changeability, the fluctuations that, that, that are noted in the patient, this is, this is part of the uh, round the clock nursing job. And so they, their, their role is also important in the management, in fact, more important than the medics. Further investigation, EEG uh, has shown some slowing of the posterior dominant rhythm and the increase in the generalized flow activity. So can be helpful, but it is also helpful to, uh, to, to exclude the non-convulsive status epilepticus. And that has been shown to, to be uh, the cause of delirium-like presentation in about 37% of the patients in one study uh, where around 198 patients were, were, were studied and in, in they actually had the non-epileptic status epilepticus, uh, non-convulsive status epilepticus. Uh, lumbar puncture, already mentioned, uh, can be done to rule out the CNS infection. So overall, the, the management in a nutshell. Diagnosis and management are very complex, best done uh, within the multidisciplinary interprofessional team. And so importance of neurologists, uh, physicians, psychiatrists, internists, intensivists, ICUs, ICU nurses, or the nurses, nursing team within the wards. Every single person has got a significant role and uh, we, we can all support each other. My role as a liaison psychiatrist, uh, um, I, I, I get a feeling of fulfillment when, when I see that I'm working with all these other disciplines uh, in, in collaboration or in liaison and in a way I'm supporting them to, to detect delirium and treat it as early as possible. Nurses can be the first uh, to detect delirium. So uh, as I said earlier, crucial role. 
at the same times they will be uh, the cornerstone of this this overall management plan because uh, they get more chance of speaking to the family or becoming in contact with the family they facilitate uh, family's presence for the effective management of the gladium and pharmacist's role uh, in terms of the medication that the patient may have already been taken uh, the current medication that they are uh, receiving and the interactions between uh, these medications uh, can be very very helpful if we involve the pharmacist all the time so uh, what do uh, what 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 do we do we need to do for management of these patients the overwhelming uh, evidence uh, in the literature at the moment and as I, as I said earlier the most recent review is is from 2019 and there are further uh, um, studies being published uh, day day by day all still suggest after decades of uh, the research that the non pharmacological treatment is the is the mainstay of the treatment and the medication are to be used only if only absolutely necessary where the the benefits outweigh the risks and what do we need to do uh, within non pharmacological treatment very very basic very simple measures uh, nursing role again important we have to support the family uh, to be present around the patient most of the time so that they don't feel that they are in unfamiliar uh, circumstances or unfamiliar environment try to reorientate them promote their sleep hygiene uh, lightning lighting in the room uh, needs to be appropriate try not to change the uh, staffing around the patient so familiar faces should be coming and managing the patient and if appropriate uh, one to one nursing has a role but that 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 can be difficult uh, if if the resources are stretched um, and so the, these and, and oxygenation again if if possible we need to nurse the patients within a side room so that there is less disruption going on around them uh, try not to move their wards uh, even if we need to try to do it as much as possible uh, that the patient remains in the in the same environment peaceful environment uh, and getting nursed by the same members of the staff day in day out if they have been sensory impairments, uh, we need to support the patients uh, to rectify them. Hearing aids, glasses, we need to offer them. If we are communicating with the patients, allow enough time. When we go to the patient, we, we need to be slow. If we want patients to do something, their hippocampal re regions are berserk. They need time to really absorb the information we are giving to them. They need time to uh, really understand what is being said to them. So instead of, uh, for any nursing intervention, instead of just going to them and touching them and trying to help them, uh, even if you are stressed for the time, uh, we need to stay there for a few minutes. We need to uh, try and reintroduce ourselves to them uh, again and again, and then explain that this is, this is where they are. So and so is happening so and so needing to be done in terms of the nursing care it is not going to hurt them and they, they, they the patients are often uh, very very fearful they are uh, frightened and anybody approaching them they 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 may feel that uh, there is an assault going on so we've got to slow down we've got to really really slow down while nursing these patients and we need to break down complicated tasks uh, help them understand as I said earlier and do not confront their false beliefs if they have uh, they have delusions they have illusions just offer reassurance uh, and and do not do not just dismiss them uh, education of the family is crucial uh, and as said earlier that uh, familiar members of the family needs to be around them so that they, they feel they are in their own environment, they are in their, their safer environment of home. Um, already touched on that, the main treatment is non-pharmacological uh, and if there are modifiable factors uh, as medication infection, we need to address them without giving any psychotropic medications. Pharmacological agents are used only for severe behavioral, challenging behavioral problems. 
and that is as said earlier around 25 percent of the patients present with the hyperactive delirium the remaining 75 percent probably will not need medication but the underlying cause need to be addressed sooner the underlying cause of that uh, delirium presentation is is resolved quicker the recovery from the delirious state so the 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 basic theory behind using the psychotropic medication or more specifically antipsychotic medication or hypnotics is that if the the patient is so aggressive uh, and they can act on their uh, psychotic symptoms they may cause harm to themselves they may cause harm to others and in these scenarios the benefits certainly outweigh the risks and uh, we can use medications the old um, uh, old is gold haloperidol uh, or very well known as market names as as serinase or dosec uh, has been has still been very effective can be the first line uh, treatment if there are no contraindications well, I, I myself did a review back in 2016 uh, and for decades uh, one reason may be that the haloperidol has been more studied drug and the other antipsychotic medication have been around for uh, much less of a time uh, than the haloperidol has been around so the people around the world are are carrying out research studies but still uh, head to head comparative studies uh, they still have shown a superior uh, role of haloperidol as compared to the other uh, antipsychotic medications so uh, haloperidol can be uh, first line but needs to be slow titration not a stat dose of 2 mg or 2.5 mg or 5 mg uh, many instances i i came across i heard uh, iv stat dose of haloperidol is given 2.5 mg 3.5 mg please do not do that giving an iv medication to an antipsychotic naive patient can lead to significant risk to their cardiac health and if you give it iv you certainly have less time than if you give it im uh, so buy some time give it oral where possible uh, even if you give it oral within half an hour you will get some benefit and then stat dose of uh, 2 mg uh, studies have shown that haloperidol as less as 2 mg can occupy all of your uh, d2 receptors dopamine receptors within the basal ganglia it's a very potent drug so use it carefully we should not use it as a bigger dose um, as a stat dose we need to titrate it up usually how i do it and how i was uh, taught it uh, during my liaison psychiatry training that we, we we depending on the age of the patient depending on the risks physical health risk factors we need to start from around 0.5 mg once a day to twice a day and on a daily basis we need to increase the dose up to a point where we either start seeing the side effects the extra pyramidal side effects from the medication or we start seeing some benefit uh, from the medication or a maximum dose as advised for delirium uh, has been reached once we reach there we need to maintain it there on that dose for around 24 to 48 hours again it's a clinical decision individual clinicians will have their preferences and after that we need to then slowly gradually reduce it down please remember the psychotropic medications are only the symptomatic management essential management essential treatment for the patient of delirium is treating the underlying cause hence wherever we are using the psychotropic medications especially the antipsychotic medication in those 25% of the patients uh, who present with hyperactive delirium uh, we we got to be cautious for uh, their 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 uh, pre treatment status physical status and if they are not aggressive if they are not uh, being a risk to to others then obviously we do not need to put them at risk of side effects from an antipsychotic medication lorazepam and benzodiazepine uh, can be considered as second line treatment uh, but be aware that it can worsen confusion not all the anti um, not all the benzodiazepine have a similar impact again uh, this this is the current best evidence we have lorazepam seems to be the safest among the benzodiazepine for delirium 
Right. Uh, now we come to the the interesting part. Probably that this is this is why many of you were uh, were interested in attending this webinar today. COVID delirium overall management. Very quick summary. Non pharmacological treatment is the most effective from the best evidence we have so far. Uh, the, the, the generally, it is reorientation strategies. It is nursing in a quiet place, uh, in a side room. It is about uh, helping the patients to, to reorientate themselves, helping and improving their, their sleep cycle. And the medication is only the last resort. But the challenges related to COVID delirium are that the medication can uh, if, if, we, if we don't give medication at an early stage, the risk of harm to others is quite high or even to the patient is quite high. Uh, let's say they are, they are uh, hyperactive and it, it, it appears that most of these patients who have COVID delirium, they, 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 they are more hyperactive, but again, not, not conclusive at this stage. There may be patients who have a similar presentation with the hyperactive delirium. But the, mostly the recent times the patients uh, referred to me have been hyperactive delirium uh, patients. And if we, if we, if we, if we don't effectively uh, treat them with the medication, the risks are that they may be uh, uh, spreading the in infection to others. And the other bit is the non-pharmacological uh, management goes out of the window uh, because these COVID patients are being treated in COVID units, usually isolation. And believe me, if you see uh, people uh, like uh, wearing the, the uh, protective uh, equipment, personal protective equipments, uh, they may feel that they are sitting in the space and some uh, space walkers are coming around them and touching them and, and tossing them around. So it is a scary uh, experience for, for these patients. So again, the basics will not change. We try to reassure them. Uh, pa patients' family cannot be around them. So that, that, is, that is the basic challenge we have with the COVID delirium. So they are in isolation. Reorientation strategies may not work as, as well. Uh, they cannot really make out uh, who, who the familiar faces are. And so the, the medication can become the, the, the major or the initial uh, treatment strategies in these cases. But the, 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 the difficulty would be these COVID-19 uh, patients will be getting some medications like chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, some antivirals. And many of our psychotropic medications have quite significant interaction with these medications. So we've got to be aware of that. Uh, and in, 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 in some of these later slides, I, I will be touching on these interactions among these medications. Right, already touched on, on, on um, uh, these, these challenges, so I will we'll quickly move on. Haloperidol is generally not licensed to use with other QTC prolonging medications. Hydroxychloroquine has an impact on the uh, QTC prolongation. Uh, antipsychotics, if they are contraindicated, uh, lorazepam can be used, but again, uh, internationally, it is not yet fully licensed for delirium. Uh, if patients have been on risperidone in the past for, let's say, if they have dementia, then it's better not to go for haloperidol and better go for the medication they have already been tried on for other reasons, of course. Um, Try to avoid polypharmacy, monitor for medication side effects and sedation, vital signs. And, and please remember, if there have been instances where uh, some physicians have resisted giving the sedatives to the patients uh, who have uh, hyperactive delirium. But remember, these patients are in medical units. You are highly equipped with these, these uh, 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 life support uh, techniques and the life support equipment. So if we don't treat the patients or their distress, that is going to cause more of a, a risk to their life uh, and risk to the safety of others around them. So better to treat them, better to calm them down. So it's, that's the fine balance we need to. Uh, strike while treating these patients with delirium in general and COVID delirium as well. 
So if, if um, we have started them on antipsychotic or a combination of antipsychotic and the uh, benzodiazepine, more specifically lorazepam, we need to assess it and reassess it. If it's a COVID delirium patient, if there hasn't been significant improvement in, in, in four days while we are titrating the medication, reassess it. And that's the principle with all the, all the illnesses. This is what I do. If I, if I expect a response in two to three days, if it isn't working, reassess it whether I miss something. There is no harm in reassessing. There is no harm in fixing if we made a mistake. If we miss something, it can happen to the best of us. Uh, it, we, we exercise our best judgment, but sometimes we can miss, miss uh, uh, vital bits in the patient presentation. And that's why multidisciplinary teams role in management of such complex presentation is so crucial that if one clinician, if one part of that multidisciplinary team will miss something, others may be able to pick it up. And coordination, coordinated effort between these multiple disciplines is so, so, so crucial. Continue to address common causes of delirium. There may be new constipation, there may be hydration, uh, dehydration. They may now be developing urinary tract infection in addition to uh, um, their uh, COVID-19 infection. And uh, similarly, they, 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 they can be some other uh, additional uh, infections in the body in addition to the COVID-19. So always reassess uh, if treatment is not effective within the course of a few days. Delirium is a transient illness uh, as uh, touched, up, touched, touched upon earlier on. So it needs, to be, uh, it, it, it needs to be fixed within the course of a few days. In terms of medication, the current doses. Now, th these are the guidelines from the Royal College of Psychiatrists as mentioned earlier, um, uh, published just a few months ago. Lorazepam and, and haloperidol, these are the first line uh, medications. We can swap them around. We can use haloperidol as first line uh, if we don't want that much of sedation and lorazepam as second line. But if it, haloperidol is, is, is contraindicated, it has more risk of interaction with other drugs, then lorazepam can be used as the first line. However, please remember, we touched upon that, that lorazepam or the benzodiazepine in general can in, worsen the confusion, but at least the hyperactivity can be controlled. So lorazepam, if we need to give it oral IM IV, we, we have this freedom, uh, but the dose should be 0 0.5 to 1 milligram once a day to up to four times a day, but the maximum is 2 milligram. Remember, many of these patients will be elderly, but in this case, they may be younger patients as well because younger adults are also coming with uh, COVID infection and the COVID delirium. And the doses can be discussed further with your pharmacist within the team. Haloperidol, please do not give IV. IV stat doses, um, uh, you, you won't get much time to, to cardio work uh, if, if there are uh, significant arrhythmias uh, developing in the patient after a, a stat IV dose. IM, you still have time. Oral preferred, wherever you can uh, convince the patient. If the patient is not in a state of uh, consenting to the treatment, in many parts of the world, we have legislations like in, in England, we have Mental Capacity Act. And uh, in discussion with the patient's family, uh, within the multidisciplinary team, discussions can take place and we can act in patient best interest. And if we need to give the COVID uh, medication, we can give that covering ourselves as well, that we are not uh, assaulting the patient. It, it, it can, in some places, seen as an assault on the patient if we are giving the medications covertly. So, and, and we should be able to justify that we are giving the medication in the best interest of the patient. Uh, for haloperidol, 0 0.5 milligram to 2 milligram once a day, uh, again, needs to be titrated up slowly. Um, and the maximum dose should be around 5 milligram per day. Uh, in most cases, I have had a very decent response uh, by the time we uh, touch the maximum dose of 3 milligram. So five milligram, believe me, is a, is a big dose. Uh, you probably would, will not need to reach that dose in most cases. Risperidone, if haloperidol has drug interaction with the, with the uh, other uh, COVID-19 medication, uh, let's say for COVID-19 delirium, 
then risperidone can be uh, an alternative choice 0.25 milligram to 0.5 milligram maximum is 2 milligram olanzapine can be used or or im im where it is available not available in all countries uh, as an im but again the maximum dose is around 10 mg and then quetiapine uh, quetiapine is uh, much more sedative than uh, the other antipsychotic medications so where sedation is required we can we can try that but again uh, the overwhelming evidence is in favor of haloperidol so where you can use haloperidol please go ahead with that 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 should be the first choice right drug interactions uh, a long list uh, there are many uh, anti Uh, uh, virals included in this list, uh, hydroxychloroquine, chloroquine. But in terms of the drug interactions with the common psychotropic medications used uh, in 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 patients who have psychotic-like presentations or who have um, uh, the uh, confusional states, uh, there are only a few who have significant drug interactions. Uh, if it's a red, then it's a no-go area. do not go there and if if you look at zopiclone zolpidem not to go not not supposed to go there midazolam not supposed to go there quetiapine generally not supposed to go there especially with a couple of drugs um, and and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll difficult names to pronounce if you are not in the habit of uh, using these names frequently then it it's it's a tongue twister but I'll, i'll i have mentioned the full names in the next slides So these are the two um, antivirals known, uh, and then the chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. And these four columns are showing the main adverse uh, um, or the uh, ad- adverse effect of the psych- psychiatric medication if used with these medications or their drug interaction. The arrow, uh, up arrow, means that uh, these antivirals or these medication increase or potentiate the effect of the uh, psychiatric medication. the hard sign means that it can uh, prolong qtc interval so haloperidol literally uh, with with these four drugs can have an impact on the uh, increased um, qtc interval so we need to if if we if we are going for haloperidol we should be monitoring the patient's qtc interval uh, using the daily ecgs olanzapine well, um, it its effect can be reduced by uh, lopinavir or ritonavir uh, same quetiapine cannot be used with these first two antivirals so overall overall we have a decent response with lorazepam uh, we are still in a fairly fairly safe area if we we, we are using haloperidol so our first two line uh, of of uh, pharmacological treatment for covid-19 delirium uh they can be fairly safe if we monitor these patients and remember these patients are in hospital many of them may be on monitors uh for 24 hour uh, uh cardiac rhythm so uh you are well equipped if, even if some complication develops we can always support them so if if the if the benefits outweighs once again that's 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 very important if the benefits outweigh the risks we got to go for the treatment and we have to have these discussions with the neuro multidisciplinary teams that we are acting in patient's best interest generally outcome um oh uh, generally it is it is accepted that the outcome is in 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 many cases unfavorable uh, especially where the uh, multiple etiologies are involved so whether it's covid-19 delirium whether it's elderly uh, with 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 dementia or whether they had medication complications whether they have other physical health complications so overall uh, more the role of etiologies different etiologies the worse the outcome uh, delirium can lead to complication itself it can it, it can lead to aspiration pneumonia inadequate uh, fluid intake patients uh, not eating or drinking frightened uh, that can have its complication as well uh, electrolyte imbalance so we we got to maintain assess reassess and continue to treat and support the patients in 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 concluding remarks uh, just a few statements and then i'll come to the question answer uh, session we'll probably have around, have around uh, 10 minutes and if there are any questions then uh, which we are not able to answer today you can always send the questions to the to 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 our organizers and i will get back to you with the answers 
So delirium is a critical illness, uh, a serious complication of hospitalization itself sometimes uh, can be associated with high morbidity and mortality, uh, can be potentially preventable. So act early and take very detailed uh, history and uh, carry out very detailed examination of the patient. Uh, that these early interventions are going to indicate a high success rate in, in recovery for these patients. The role of the impaired cholinergic transmission, inflammation, impaired oxidative metabolisms, quite, quite uh, significant nowadays with COVID delirium has been implicated in the development of uh, delirium. And uh, I cannot stress enough on it. Role of the multidisciplinary effort is very crucial whether we manage the patients without uh, medications and with, with medications. I, I, I personally wanted to uh, design a randomized control trials to compare the, the non-pharmacological management with the pharmacological management, wh whatever was superior. Uh, but haven't had the time yet. Uh, I had the proposal ready uh, as part of my uh, MSc in, in neuropsychiatry, but uh, there wasn't enough time to carry out such such uh, an extensive pro project. So at some stage, I will be carrying out uh, a study head-to-head -head comparison with the non-pharmacological uh, treatment interventions, comparing them with the pharmacological intervention and see which one is superior. And uh, I will urge whoever among you can carry out such such studies. Uh, we there there is there is need for more data. There is need for more literature on on management of these patients. And considering the high mortality rate uh, for many of these patients, uh, we we do need more treatment strategies. We do need to underline the mechanisms of uh, development of delirium, even more than how much we we understand for now. Thank you very much. And we come to the question uh, answer screen and I'll let our organizers open the. Right, what can be done at home to reduce acute confusion? Well, uh, non-pharmacological treatment, as, as I mentioned that many studies uh, uh, suggest that the, the, these patients can be managed without any medications. And re try to reorientate, try not to force patients to do things uh, that you want them to do. If they are uh, having delusions, try not to challenge them. Uh, ensure that you are hydrating them, you're feeding them. Um, just, just like if, if, if you have young kids and uh, you want to make sure that they sleep at the right time, you, you, you create an environment uh, for them to, to fall off to sleep. Same as the principle here, uh, low stimulus environment is crucial. How long it takes to come out of its uh, danger once diagnosed? Well, uh, it's transient. If we are able to manage the underlying uh, uh, conditions, we, uh, we, we patients come out of it within the course of days. Uh, in most cases, I have seen um, two or three days uh, but um, I would have to confess that I have seen a patient who, who had delirium for several weeks. And I, uh, I, I, I literally had a bit of a, a difference of opinion with the treating team, the treating physical team. They were insisting that it's a psychotic illness. Uh, but the way it started uh, very quickly, uh, and there was no past history of uh, a psychotic illness. So a psychotic-like presentation suddenly presenting at the age of 60 wouldn't make sense to me. So I, I insisted on, uh, on, on, on this being a delirious state. And their uh, argument was that delirium is, is not that prolonged. But believe me, it can be prolonged if it is the underlying causes are not appropriately treated. Uh, but most cases, just a few days if, if, if we are. But the, the psychiatric medication are not the answer. It's, it's psychiatric medications are just the supportive management, uh, just the symptomatic management. It's the underlying causes that, that, that uh, need to be treated as early as possible for the full patient's recovery. Does the different screening scales have any effect on the therapeutic management of patients? Well, not really therapeutic management, but uh, uh, it, it, they do help us recognize delirium early. If we have not had a um, significant chunk of our training uh, assessing and management, managing delirium, then 
it is always useful to have these uh, uh, scales, uh, rating scales or assessment scales available in the wards so that even your, uh, uh, your trainees uh, can use that. And it, they are very easy to use and provide very, very crucial bits of information and point towards the uh, delirium as a diagnosis. Right. How do clinically how do clinically suspect COVID encephalitis or we are to regard every encephalitis as COVID unless proven otherwise? Well, um, not my, my area of expertise, so I shouldn't jump into it. All I can say is um, uh, do the basics right. Um, can be COVID encephalitis. Uh, in, in fact, I have recently uh, come across a, a paper where it said that. Uh, without the typical COVID-19 symptoms, patients can present with delirium. Um, and if it's only later on during the course of the investigation, we, we, we can come up with uh, the, the, the fact that the patient had uh, a COVID-19 positive test. Now, this can lead to encephalitis. This can lead to uh, just, the, just the toxic effect of the COVID infection itself in the body. But... Uh, probably the area of the neurologists uh, or, or the COVID-19 specialists who are dealing uh, with these patients in the ICUs. Can we use antipsychotics for the patients with Parkinson's disease or Lewy body dementia? Uh, generally, it is, it, I, I think I did mention in one of my slides as well, try to avoid it. If we can get the help from the lorazepam, fair enough, we should do that. Uh, the two drugs which have been uh, used for Parkinson's disease and Lewy body dementia. One is uh, quetiapine, but still has D2 uh, antagonism activity. And the other one is uh, uh, clozapine uh, for um, uh, Parkinson's disease, dementia. Uh, sometimes it has been used. And uh, clozapine is effective because it's, it's the chunk of its effect, its effect is on D4 receptors rather than D2. Uh, dopamine receptors. So um, to cut it short, antipsychotics where possible avoid uh, in Parkinson's disease and Lewy body dementia. If you have to use them, go for safer options. Safer options can be uh, quetiapine, but you need to keep an eye on what medications are being used for the COVID-19 treatment. So uh, again, role of the pharmacy will become absolutely necessary in, in, in treating these patients. Is COVID delirium observed in uh, pediatric age groups? Uh, so far, uh, nothing has been reported. Nothing has come to at least my notice. Uh, they, there are studies going on all around the world. In theory, in theory, uh, it can happen. Uh, but but no, no, no reports as yet uh, that I, I may have seen. But the other challenge may be that the, we don't know how delirium presents in, in, in children. Um, in, 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 in most of the scenarios. So it's, it's a whole new area that has opened and further research will be required and further research I'm sure is, is, is happening. But if we follow the basics, uh, if we, if we, if we uh, really need medication, if the benefits uh, outweigh the risks, we have to go for the medication. That's, that's just the basic principle. What is the clinical presentation of hyperactivity? Well, uh, confusion. Uh, problem with the with the alertness, the the this, the same old uh, four uh, features that I mentioned about the presentation of delirium, but the aggression or the hyperactivity will be missing. The remaining bits are going to be the same, and that's where if, if, if the patient is lying in their bed uh, peacefully, not doing anything, not saying anything, not sleeping in time, not eating anything, it's not probably much of a problem for the managing team. Uh, but please uh, do not forget that we should not leave it untreated. And by leaving it untreated, I do not mean that we have to give them psychiatric medications. It is about uh, picking it up further. What is going, what toxic going on in the body of the patient? Uh, and are there any physical bits that we are missing and we need to address them as quickly as possible? Based on the pathophysiology of COVID delirium, is there any role of continuous oxygen therapy for the treatment of delirium? without going into medications. Well, oxygenation is, is, is a mechanism. If there is uh, um, hypoxemia, uh, it, it is known to cause uh, uh, neuroinflammation. It is a mechanism of 
development of delirium. So in theory, this is likely to help, but depends if the patient is going to keep the oxygen uh, tubes on. Uh, if they are hyperactive, uh, then it may be difficult to convince them to keep it on. And hence, there may be a role of the psychiatric medications or the psychotropic medication to calm them down enough to comply with the treatment strategies. What will be the prognosis once the patient of COVID develops delirium? Uh, guarded, guarded at best. Uh, we, we, we don't know, we don't have enough studies uh, about the COVID delirium, uh, what will be the longer term outcome. I want to ask that if the patient is known diabetic and having too much daytime sleep, his blood glucose is normal and good control, currently no infection going on, no signs of other disease, taking adequate water as well, recently ECG, echo normal, uh, then what should be your next step? Wow. Uh, being a psychiatrist, probably not my, uh, my area to comment on that. So uh, I shouldn't be giving you an, uh, an advice on something which, which is not my area of expertise. Uh, would suggest that you should uh, refer to a physician, uh, especially uh, having experience of dealing with uh, the, the, if it is to do with the COVID-19, I don't think you have mentioned anything about the COVID-19 patient. Right, um, I have a few questions. Is delirium a mental illness? Well, it's a clinical syndrome. We touched on that in the very beginning of this, this uh, uh, webinar. That it's a clinical syndrome, not the mental illness within its right. If any, any uh, uh, condition can cause impairment of mind, uh, then it can be, come, can, can, be under, uh, can be treated under the definition of the mental illness, but that's for the legal purpose. If you are in England, for example, we have Mental Health Act, and we have to have uh, uh, a, a clearly defined goals, parameters, which illness or which condition or which presentation will be considered within the mental illnesses. But on the whole, it is, it is still considered to be uh, a, a medical emergency, a medical condition, and that is having an impact on patients' mental health. So uh, the physicians and the psychiatrists have to work together. How do we manage a patient with the pre-existing psychiatric illness like bipolar who developed delirium, considering he might be taking haloperidol or some other antipsychotics in a high dose prior to his start of the delirium? Your clinical judgment will dictate it. Uh, we, if, if not treating the patient with the high dose is going to cause more of a risk, then we have to, we can justify treating the patient with the high doses. What is the, what are the in, 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 in directions of medication use? Sorry, I, I could not understand this question. How common is delirium in COVID patients? Uh, we don't know. I don't have the statistics yet. It's, it's a new condition, uh, um, so I, I don't have the figures yet. Uh, but it is, it is uh, one webinar that I recently uh, attended uh, within the uh, liaison psychiatry uh, faculty in England. It, it, it's, it, the, the incidence is quite high. What is the impact of delirium in young and otherwise healthy patients? Um, same, nothing different from uh, the delirium in elderly. Uh, but I, I believe the older the age, older the patient, the recovery or the longer term outcome is, is, is guarded. Uh, maybe there's a possibility that the younger age protect them for the longer term effects. But the studies so far have suggested that uh, if the patients have developed delirium or uh, once or more than once, uh, there is a fear, there is a risk of developing dementia. How? We don't know yet. We don't fully understand it yet. Do the patients recover completely before the COVID treatment? And what are the after effects? Don't know, uh, probably the people treating these patients within the COVID units are the best place to answer that. But uh, again, we need to stick to the basics. We need to manage them. We need to keep them safe and we need to keep others looking after them safe. And sooner, sooner or later, my patients do recover. Uh, from the delirium and being a transient condition uh, within the course of a few days, if we provide enough oxygenation to them, uh, they should be able to recover. How to combat phobia among COVID patients and those fearing COVID, but not diagnosed or symptomatic of it. I have seen many facing phobia more than the disease itself. Well, 
um, I, I would I would suggest to them do not watch uh, the news. Uh, that's one part of it. We have to do counseling. There has to be a reason why they are so much frightened about it. The stories like once you have uh, been diagnosed to have um, you know, COVID-19, you will be taken away somewhere and if you die, you are never uh, uh, going to see your family. These are the fears that the patients have and we need to address them. We need to address them very, very carefully. There, there is always a reason why somebody gets angry, why somebody gets frightened and they may not be able to open up and discuss it, uh, uh, discuss their fears openly with the, with the clinicians because sometimes clinicians may be the part of the problem. Right, uh, what is the ratio of development of delirium in COVID patients? Um, I already said, don't know, don't have the figures yet, but uh, so far reported that there is a high ratio. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have the exact figures. Does the COVID-19 delirium affect the disease prognosis? Um, once again, don't know. Uh, delirium is 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 a symptom uh, that there is a toxic effect of COVID-19 itself in the body, uh, but we, we have to focus on the treatment of COVID-19 itself and uh, make the patient comfortable um, and hope for the best. Uh, the prognosis in, in several places, it, it, it has been described as guarded at best, uh, more so for the elderly population. How much sleep to a case of delirium? Well, um, I always uh, say that our body dictates how much sleep we need. And it will grab that sleep, our brain will get that sleep, snatch that sleep from us. We just have to uh, facilitate that natural mechanism of, of brain trying to get the sleep. Uh, and, and, and really that's about it. And, and sleep is often going to help hippocampal region get back on track. Uh, it is the rapid eye movement sleep where the, the hippocampal regions consolidate our memories, consolidate our uh, uh, expressions, um, e e experience from day to day uh, life. So it, it, it is certainly going to help. So uh, more the better, I would say at best. And I think that's all with the questions. Thank you very much. We went just five minutes uh, or four minutes uh, about the allocated time. Hope, hope you enjoyed it. Any other questions, uh, you can always uh, send an email to our um, CME department and they can get back to me and I'll, I'll try to get back to you with an answer whenever I can. Thank you very much.